the THC receptor, so we talk of THC ligands, anything that will bind that receptor. We make our own THC in, in the form of these anaamide and 2-AGs. I've often said that THC is an unusual psychoactive compound because it doesn't contain a nitrogen atom. I don't have a structure of THC here, but THC is essentially a hydrocarbon with <coughs> two oxygen atoms. And it used to puzzle me why that psychoactive effect would be elicited when there's no nitrogen atom in every other psychoactive compound, including cocaine, LSD, heroin, all of these compounds contain nitrogen atoms, not so in, in THC. <laughs> Nevertheless, the receptor is that binds THC is designed to bind a nitrogen atom. Both anaamide and 2-AG contain nitrogen atoms. So why <coughs> THC binds that receptor, and the THC from the cannabis plant binds that receptor nuts, is just a fluke. Well, is it because it's natural? Like it's not chemically produced? Ah, good point. Um, I am of the mind that synthetics don't work in biological systems. They will elicit effect, but in, in time we've broken down differently and caused damage. Um, the receptor is there to bind our own THC, if you like, our own neurotransmitters that are there to bind that, that specific receptor. We may grow. If you get a punch in the head, anaamide and 2-AG are joining on the spot binding that receptor to this effect. They're, <coughs> they're synthesized in the cell membrane. Let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself in the next slide I'm going to talk about that. But the overall effect of that receptor being bound is down regulation of neurotransmission. Now normally when a receptor is bound on a postsynaptic Oh, these will be nerves, so this will be presynapse, this is postsynapse, this is a nerve junction in the middle. You have to send an impulse from this presynapse to this postsynapse to elicit a response down that, that nerve cell. So well, what happens with uh, the endocannabinoid receptors, the neurotransmitter is sent presynaptically to the postsynapse where the receptor is. Normally a receptor is postsynapse, not presynapse, but endocannabinoids have a presynaptic receptor. It's the opposite of classical neurotransmission. It's backwards. What implications that have, uh, it, it's, it can have a lot. Um, it's it's a, a sort of binding that can be elicited right away because the neurotransmitter is produced in the cell membrane, dumped into the synapse. Whether it's reversed or not, it's an instant sort of action. The overall effect of that downregulation of neurotransmission is homeostasis, a balancing of the nerve cell. The nerve cell is able to, the reason the receptor is there is to <coughs> toggle the nerve cell so that the, the neurotransmission is regulated in a, in a quiet, un-anti-inflammatory, let's not get excited type way. By binding that receptor, you're telling the nerve cell to shut up, to calm down, it's going to be okay. So is it like, like, does it prohibit the nerve cell from actually like connecting this signal? Like, because it's presynaptic, right? It it's slows it down. Oh, okay. it, it's, it's, uh, what do they call it? Um, the signal, not retrograde signal. I'll dredge it up. Uh, anyway, I just mentioned retrograde signaling, which is the backwards. Uh, neurotransmission. For diagrams, I tried to pull one up and put a diagram into my PowerPoint, but I couldn't make it work in this thing, so I, I just copied a website there where if you type, if you find this website, you can get the images from Google, or if you Google retrograde one word signaling, 
and click on the images, you'll get diagrams of how retrograde signaling works. If you're into this sort of <coughs> biochemical stuff around the um, And I put a little line of CP1 most abundant binding site in the human brain. There's a, a quote somewhere that says that cannabinoid receptors are the most abundant binding site in the human brain, and I do like that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on that note, for uh, for the uptake, is it not cannabis? Um, the human body uses it in the same format as um, benzodiazepines, for instance, in opiates. Is it the same uptake pathways that that uh, these receptors kind of use? Uh, the pathways are completely different. Each one has its own pathway. The endocannabinoid system in my mind, is much bigger than the opiate system, for example, because the opiate system essentially works in a part of the brain that controls pain and, and mood, and three or four neurotransmitters are involved with that system, whereas the endocannabinoid system is in every part of the brain throughout the whole nervous system, plus on peripheral tissues, and um, <coughs> being in every part of the brain and also affecting every neurotransmitter that we know of, not just endorphin and... So all the GABA, all the GABA receptors in general? Yeah, all of them, all of them are affected. Now, when you say down regulation and neurotransmission, you might be pulling back serotonin and dopamine, but you could be pulling back a, a stimulatory neurotransmitter or you can pull back an inhibitory neurotransmitter that will stimulate the response on the other side, right? So it's a, <laughs> I've often <coughs> said that there are more brain cells in our head than there are ants on the planet. We're extremely complex biological systems. Our brain is the most complex on the planet, and we should be considering ourselves sacred rather than shooting each other. <laughs> You're here. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> okay, now let's. I want you to make that point about the endocannabinoid system because I do feel that in, there's so much involved with it that it's going to take a long time to unravel it all. But in 10 or 15 years, we'll look back at the, the last millennium and say that this endocannabinoid system was the biggest medical discovery next to DNA. Uh, it's an enormous and amazing <coughs> Uh, discovery that we haven't even scratched the surface of yet. Now, I want to talk about the research that we've been doing at the Green Cross Society, which is on Kingsway in Vancouver. The Green Cross Society is a provincially registered nonprofit members run society, has a federal business license to distribute cannabis for medicinal purposes, and differs from other clubs, as it is Compassion Club, other clubs in North America, and that we standardize and quality control all the product that goes out to members. By quality control, I mean we test for pesticides, heavy metals, and pathogenic microorganisms. <coughs> and by standardization, I mean we quantify and identify the most abundant cannabinoids present in the cannabis, namely THC, CBN and CBD, which are the three most abundant uh, cannabinoids in BC bud. Of our roughly 4,000 membership, all of them are disabled. 70% um, are managing chronic pain as a result of on a job injury, car accidents, or various trauma or illnesses. Because we're a members run society, we direct most of our attention to chronic pain because that's what we're dealing with. 40% of our members are HIV positive. Um, they 